Welcome to the UP Notable Books Club, brought to you by the Upper Peninsula Publisher and Authors Association. James H. McCommons joined the Northern Michigan University Faculty English Department in 2001. He is a veteran journalist specializing in ecology, environmental, and travel topics. He has written hundreds of general interest magazine articles and recently contributed to the History Channel, Wildlife Conservation, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and many other publications. He also attended the Art Institute of Boston, majoring in photography, and later earned a BA in creative writing from the University of Pittsburgh. He earned an MA in magazine journalism from the Newhouse School of Public Communications at Syracuse University, and an MS in environmental science from the College of Environmental Science and Forestry, Sunny. Um, we have with us James McCommons, author of Camera Hunter, George Sh- Shearis, 3D, is that what he is in the book when we read it? Not Gyrus. 3D. Shyrus. Shyrus. The Birth of Wildlife Photography. Did I say it wrong? Shyrus? Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so okay. correct all my mistakes. That would be good, especially when you, <laughs> but um, a really nice book. I enjoyed reading it and I hope the rest of you did too. James mm-hmm. mentioned he's going to have a little presentation and then he'll take questions and answers. But before James starts, Victor, is there anything you'd like to add tonight? I'd just like to welcome everybody uh, on behalf of the Upper Peninsula Publishers and Authors Association. We are co-sponsoring this with the Crystal Falls Community District Library. And uh, it's a really exciting opportunity for people to learn more about UP literature. And if you are writing yourself or you want to be writing, please come and join the Upper Peninsula Publishers and Authors Association at uppaa.org. Thanks. Thank you, Victor. And thanks for all your support. Without you guys, this would not be possible. And I think I, I'm going to go ahead and speak for all of us. It's been a real enjoyable experience reading awesome. books I, I never would have read before. So, mm-hmm. okay. Well, James, I guess it's up to you now. I'm ready to go. Okay. Right. So um, just to uh, I teach at Northern Michigan University, and when I moved to Marquette in 2001, which was the second time that I lived in the UP, I'm from Pennsylvania originally, I kept hearing about this guy named Shyrus, and um, I would see things around town named after him. I would see these photographs in different places, and uh, I, the more I learned about the man, the more I learned that he was really an important figure in the early 20th century conservation movement. And he has this strong link to the Upper Peninsula, particularly to the Marquette area. So I'll go into more detail about that. But that's how I got started doing the book. I just, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I just started to um, learn more about him. And then um, I was in Pittsburgh where I used to go to school and that's where George is from. Mm -hmm. And, I, um, you can see that, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I, I went to Pittsburgh to see where George was from, and, and I, um, I discovered a whole box of materials, three boxes of an unfinished autobiography, uh, letters between him and um, Theodore Roosevelt, and a bunch of material that made me realize that I could write a book. I would have enough material no, to write a book. And then, and then that's what I went ahead and did over the course of about six years. Um, so I'll just give you, a, a, you know, 30 minutes here of who George Shiras was. Some of you may know who he is uh, and about his photography, but also about his conservation legacy. So he's well known for his photographs, mostly of deer, mostly taken at night. Uh, this one's called Innocence Abroad. These were taken in the 1880s um, on Whitefish Lake near Marquette. They are, this is a, um, an albino um, uh, animal that he saw while he was there. He, he really liked albinos, so he often shot pictures of albinos when he could. This one, uh, this porcupine lived for like five or six years and he took a whole series of photographs of him. Uh, and another deer picture taken at that time um, now, who was the uh, George Shiras? Well, I told you they were from Pittsburgh. 
This is the Shiras family. This picture was taken in the 1890s. All of the men in this picture are named George Shiras. Oh. Uh, this is George Shiras <laughs> Sr., George Shiras Jr. This is our guy, George Shiras III. And there's a baby here that he's holding, and that's George Shiras IV. Uh, George took this picture using a, um, 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 he has a bulb in his hand, it's a self portrait. And he calls it uh, the Four Georges, all sportsmen. Um, <laughs> George Sr. first started to come to the UP in um, 1849. He took a steamer up to Sault Ste. Marie and he, he was a fly fisherman and he fished on the Whitefish, uh, on the St. Mary's River for uh, trout. And then he took a boat down the shore and uh, met Peter White. Peter White was a young man of just 19 who was helping uh, build the town of Marquette. Later, George Sr. started to bring back his son, George Jr. And George Jr. was a lawyer. He went to school at Yale um, and became a corporate attorney and a US Supreme Court justice. Uh, these guys were, this was a wealthy family from Pittsburgh. They had made their money uh, in brewing beer and uh, spirits uh, uh, prior to the Civil War. George III came along when he was just 10 years old and he started to come to the UP. And then of course he brought his son as well. They came here because the families, the wealthier families in Pittsburgh uh, would want to escape Pittsburgh in the summer. It was dirty, it was hot. Uh, Pittsburgh at that time was known as hell with the lid off. And uh, that's because of the pollution and the smoke and everything else. So a lot of these rich families came to uh, the Great Lakes where it was cooler and they could spend the summer. Of course, they met Peter White. This is Peter White when he was much older uh, and became friends with Peter White. So the Shires has made Marquette their, their main place that they, they like to come to. Peter White controlled a piece of land between Marquette and Munising here. Um, on the Whitefish River. And this is a picture of it today. This is the Laughing Whitefish River. It's looking south towards, um, towards um, Laughing Whitefish Falls. If you've been there before, Laughing Whitefish Falls is down here. Whitefish Lake is sort of a, a wide spot in the river. Um, White owned a lot of land around this and he kind of made it his uh, hunting preserve. Well, they built this beautiful cabin there. <laughs> and, uh, and this was again around the 1880s, uh, the dugout canoe. This is a picture, an early picture in the 1880s of them hunting. This is Peter White right here. These two guys are English lords and they are here to, um, in, in the States to overlook their holdings in the iron mines uh, in Nagani and Ishpeging, and Peter White took them hunting. The rest of the men are uh, guides and packers. This guy here is a guy named Jack Lapete. Jack Lapete was a um, French Indian man from Sault Ste. Marie who came to Marquette to work for Peter White, mostly as a guide. And Lapete also lived out on the lake um, most of the year round, trapped and hunted. This is a picture of Jack Lapete close up in the studio. Lapete took George Shiras III. So as a young man, the guy we're talking about, this is George Shiras III in his 20s. He first took George Shiras out to the, to the camp when George was just about 10 and took uh, George and his brother hunting so they could shoot their first deer. The deer tended to be on the south side of the lake in an area they called the slough where there were a lot of mineral licks and they could always find deer there. Now, back then they hunted year round. Uh, there were no game laws and no real, you know, um, strictures about how they could hunt. So they would hunt at night and they would put a skillet 
on the front of their canoe or skiff, they would put in uh, pitch pine, birch bark, and they would create a spotlight. And so they would go out and jack deer with this. They would go out in the middle of the lake, they'd listen for a deer, and then when uh, they heard it, they would go into shore and uh, the light would, or they hoped, freeze the deer long enough for one of the boys to stand up and shoot it. And he would use a shotgun with big pellets. Um, the camp eventually morphed into a bigger camp over the years during the decades. And this is when they're building um, uh, some new, new structures. The guides initially were out there just to help the men, but they also became caretakers and builders. And eventually it morphed into this beautiful camp. Um, and they would walk out in the early years, they would walk all the way from Marquette uh, out there, which is about 20 miles. Uh, later, Peter White had a private railroad car. They would bring the private railroad car to Deerton, which is just um, uh, along US 28. And then they would walk to two or three miles into camp. Today, you can drive down to the camp on the Peter White Road. So by the 1920s, this is how the camp looked. Um, it became a place for the families to come to. This is Peter White's widow right here. Peter White had died by this time. Um, this is his widow. This is his daughter, Fanny White. Now, Fanny White was rich. Uh, Peter White became very wealthy. And, and so Fanny was kind of the daughter of the richest man in Marquette. George Shiras right here was the rich young boy from Pittsburgh. The two grew up together. They spent their summers together. And when they became uh, in their 20s, they fell in love. And so the two, they married. So the White family and the Shivers family that was initially friends became united through marriage. And then these are some of their children, nieces and nephews. This is the Supreme Court justice. And in, in this picture, he is on the Supreme Court at this time. And this is uh, George Moore as a um, middle-aged man. So here he is when he's a little bit younger. He follows his father in the law and becomes a corporate lawyer in Pittsburgh. In fact, he takes over his father's firm when his father moves to D.C. to become a Supreme Court justice. Now, he doesn't get, he's not able to get up to camp like he used to. Um, and in the summer, he'd love to go hunt deer like he used to but he can't, so he decides that he's going to take pictures of deer. He still wanted to hunt them, so he decided he would become a camera hunter. And he didn't really quite know what he was doing, but he had money and he had friends back in Pittsburgh who were experimenting with uh, photography and it was a new hobby. So the first thing he brought up there was this landscape camera. It had a very slow um, glass plates that took a lot of light to expose the image. And it um, had no shutter. You just took the lens cap off and put it back on. Well, George thought he could take pictures of deer with this thing. He couldn't. Um, you know, the deer would run away by the time he got everything set up. And it just didn't work very well. So he got, um, you know, technology was, uh, getting better all the time. So he got this thing called a Schmid detective camera. And it was supposedly a detective camera because a detective could, could uh, take pictures in a low light. It was easy to carry. Uh, and it was different. You could look, you could look down through the top, uh, through the viewfinder. Uh, you had a lens that actually had a pretty fast shutter. And the um, the glass plates in the back were getting more light sensitive. So he finally got a picture of a deer after about two, two years of trying, except the deer was pretty small in the, um, um, in the field of view. He got several of these daytime pictures. He entered them in a contest in Forest and Stream magazine. Now this magazine was one of the first outdoor magazines and was really important. A lot of people read this, including scientists and including um, uh, anybody who was a sportsman. 
And he won the contest with one of his photographs. And one of the judges for that photo, for that contest was um, Theodore Roosevelt. And it was how he first became acquainted with Theodore Roosevelt. Um, he, he kept improving his technique. He got different cameras and he decided the best way that he could take pictures is to separate himself, the operator, from the camera. So he would set up a camera in a blind or someplace where he could point it. And then he would tie a string to it and um, using eye hooks, take the string back maybe even 50 yards and hide in a blind and wait for something to go, go in front of the camera. And you can see a little bird here, right here. Well, this was the picture that resulted from that. He saw these wax wings were flying back and forth across the river. So he put this uh, branch into the river. And when they landed there, he was able to pull the string from a, quite a distance and, and take the picture. However, he was still having, it was still difficult to get these pictures. So what he remembered was the time he used to go out with Jack Lapeat and Jack light deer. And so he had been seeing people using these bright strobes, these, these chemical flashes in Pittsburgh. So one year he brought them, he brought it back to Whitefish Lake. And he asked one of the guides to go out with him. And he said, let's try taking a picture at night. And um, this, the, the flash powder that you use was basically mag magnesium potassium chlorate. There were some other mixtures too. And he, he eventually found one mixture that worked very well for him. And he created this setup. Um, he had the two cameras in the front of the skiff. He had, he had him on a pivot so he could turn this box left and right. This was his, um, his jack light, which was a parabolic mirror and a kerosene lantern. So it was much better than a, um, a skillet full of uh, pitch pine or something. And this was his flashlight. This was where he held the powder and he had a little shield here that would help reflect it and also protect him. When this thing went off, it went off with a great explosion and a great flashlight. There were different times he caught himself on fire using this. Um, it could be dangerous. But they would do the same thing. They would go out in the middle of the lake, they'd hear a deer, and then they would approach it with and uh, shine the jack light on it, and then they would take the picture. Now he patented this device with the idea that maybe he could sell it. But the fact was, with all the work that Shivers did over the years, it was complicated. It wasn't for amateurs. And they never really made any money on um, selling this to other people. His cameras were quite crude. These are some of the original cameras that still survive um, and somewhat homemade that he would fix these things up so they would um, be able to work on a boat. The real power of the camera uh, was in this Bosch Lom Unicum shutter. Again, this technology is improving year after year. This one had a leaf shutter uh, right here. It had a diaphragm that went down to 128. And what that means is that you have a, a you have a large depth of field, meaning if you can if you can if you can turn it down to 128, that will put everything in focus from close in front of the lens to infinity. It also had speeds up to a hundredth of a second which is enough to stop an animal um, uh, when you're taking its picture, particularly when you're using a flash. And it had pretty good optics. So now he had something that really was going to work well for him. And he had teamed up with this man, John Hammer. John Hammer had been working at the camp for many years. He was an immigrant to Marquette, and he was a former machinist. Um, he started to work with Shiras as his partner and as his guide. Um, and um, they started to build these devices. Uh, probably Shiras, I think uh, Shiras had a lot to do, do with this, but um, Hammer had mechanical skills. 
So they put the flash powder right in this canister, put paraffin wax on it so it would it would get wet, it would still go up, it would still work. And then they created this kind of pistol gun, which would shoot either a 22 blank cartridge or a um, shotgun shell, and that would set off the, uh, the powder. Now, the, uh, just to back up for a second, the trick is, which took them years to figure out is, how do you get the flash to go off at the same time when the shutter opens? That's called synchronization. And they had a hard time syncing the flash with these shutters. But eventually, as they built these devices, they, they, uh, they got it down. And they took some extraordinarily beautiful photographs at night. This was a snowy owl that they took, or not even a snowy owl, but, um, but an owl that they took pictures of um, one night on, on the river. This beaver is a picture that they took. Um, again, when the flash would go off with the, um, with the explosion, it would just scare the heck out of these animals. And this beaver never came back. The owl actually fell out of the tree after they had its picture taken. And, um, and, and they often uh, shot these deer and other people who were hunting in the area who were trying to hunt at night and jack light deer, they found that it was hard to do around uh, Whitefish Lake because the deer were so scared of it already. Uh, and that's because Shivers had been taking their pictures. <laughs> he eventually um, put these things together in a series that he called the Midnight Series. He sold these at shows. He sold these at recreation um, shows. There were these big shows. He made, in today's money, over a half a million dollars selling these wild game photographs. Um, no one else was doing this kind of work anywhere else in the world. These were really unique photographs. People had not seen um, images of wild animals like this before. Now, at the same time he's doing this, he's also inventing the camera trap. The camera trap is the predecessor of the trail camera, the scout camera. All those cameras people are putting in the woods today um, using laser trips and all that kind of digital cameras. George Shivers invented that and he invented it in the UP and he invented it at Whitefish Lake. So they, they created these devices and they put up trip wires. The animals would trip the wires. He used multiple cameras as a way to um, make sure he got a photo. They would often set the cameras up in the woods at night and then they would go back to the cabin, or this was a houseboat that they used in the summer on the lake. And then they pulled it up on shore in the winter. And sometimes they would go back out there and, and stay in that. They would hear these explosions going off in the night. And then they would go back and harvest the, the glass plates, uh, the exposures that were taken. Hammer was very important in this whole process. There was a couple of uh, devices that he also patented. Uh, they had a mechanical air pump mechanism that um, they used. And again, it made the devices and the synchronization quite reliable. And here's a series of, of, of some of the devices that, that they used. All mechanical, where today everything, of course, is um, is electronic. Um, they would have to work at this for days sometimes to set up a shot. Uh, and so here's a test that they're doing with a white card. And um, there's Shivers in the front, hammer in the back. Here's another one of Shivers right here holding the flashlight. Um, so they would take these images and, and try to make sure that they got the correct exposures before they set it up. <laughs> Shivers built a dark room in the camp so he could immediately go back and um, develop these to see how they work. And when they work, of course, they work quite beautifully. This is a picture he took, of course, of a raccoon uh, pulling on a piece, pulling on a string with a piece of meat attached to it. Um, he, he, this is a, 
albino deer that tripped a wire that he had put down. He would often put salt on the ground or some kind of food that would get them to, to paw at the ground and, and uh, trip it. He also uh, started to use two flashlights, one that would get the animals in motion and that wouldn't take the picture, but then the second one would go off almost immediately afterward. The, the shutter would open and they would get the animals in motion. Now, this is one of his most iconic images that um, you still see today, uh, where these deer are sort of almost like birds flying away. <laughs> he had a bait pile right here, and he had two of these set up. Now, he would set all this up, and then he would not be there for the picture. It would be, you know, he would, he would not know what he got until he developed in the dark room. Now, he was a lawyer back in Pittsburgh. He was staying up in Marquette weeks at a time. His wife would come back here and stay with her parents. She had her children back here. So when she was pregnant, she would be spending months up here. But back in Pittsburgh, he was also a politician and he ran for the House of Representatives as a Reform Party candidate. And he was part of the progressive movement uh, in the early 20th century which was really championed by Theodore Roosevelt. He, he was very familiar with Washington because his father was already living there. But then when he moved there to actually um, become a congressman, he joined the Boone and Crockett Club. Um, and at the Boone and Crockett Club one night at the Willard Hotel, he gave a, um, a lantern slide presentation to the club and that included Theodore Roosevelt was there and, and all these luminaries. Um, but the one person who was there was the young editor for National Geographic magazine, Gilbert Grosvenor. And Grosvenor saw these pictures and he thought they were wonderful. And National Geographic at that time did not run photographs. It was a, it was a text oriented magazine. It was small. It, it didn't have many subscribers. It only had three, um, employees. And, um, and it was also at the same time when you could just start putting photography in the magazines and newspapers anyway. So he talked to Shiras. He said, I want to run all of your photos in the next issue. And they put 70 photos uh, from the Honorable George Shiras III, who was a congressman then, um, in the magazine. Excuse me. It created a sensation and it, it changed the direction of the magazine. The magazine, from that point on, photography became important. It also changed Shiras's life because he really became part of the National Geographic family. And again, these are some of the photos in that first issue. People had not seen uh, photographs of animals like this. They were utterly unique. And um, so he got well known that way. And then he did important work in Congress. He only stayed in Congress two years because he really wanted just to dedicate himself to photography and wildlife issues. And he was wealthy and he did not need to, um, to work at this point. He was in his late thirties. But he was on the Public Lands Committee, which was a very important committee when he was in Congress, partly because Roosevelt was starting to set aside all of this, um, the, this land, national forests and those kind of things. And being in Washington was being at the heart of the conservation movement in the progressive era. So he really got to know a lot of people there at the Smithsonian and in other places as well. The one important bill he introduced was the Shiras Bird Bill. And this was to protect migratory game birds in the United States. Now, it was open hunting on birds at that time and they weren't being protected. They could be shot pretty much year round. And George thought that, they, that the government should take federal jurisdiction over birds. And that was not popular with a lot of people at that time. There were a lot of states' rights issues um, and the bill didn't pass. George just wanted to introduce it formally as a piece of legislation. And then he would spend the next several years along with other people 
trying to get it passed. But it was important at that time. Birds were disappearing. Um, and much of wildlife was disappearing. You had lost the buffalo on the on the Great Plains. This is the passenger pigeon. Uh, it was disappearing. It went extinct. Its last bastion um, was northern Michigan. Um, people were hunting year round. They were market hunting, and so there were a lot of um, uh, there were a lack of game laws in, in a lot of places. Um, people were also hunting for the millinery industry. All women at that time had to have uh, feathers in their hats and, and you know, beautiful feathers, often shorebirds, egrets, those kinds of birds, uh, flamingos, they were getting scarce. And, um, and it was legal for these people to go out and just kill birds and, and, and do this. So there was a big movement to somehow get control of this. Um, this is a letter that we found in Pittsburgh and it's now at the NMU archives, but it's a letter from Theodore Roosevelt thanking Shiras, uh, how pleased he is with your bill and that we're so glad we have a man in Congress taking an interest in the preservation of birds and nature generally. Um, Shiras created a close friendship with Theodore Roosevelt over these years. And he started to shoot a lot for National Geographic. So this is a series of stories that he did about this albino porcupine that he saw it at Whitefish Lake. Uh, he teamed up with other naturalists of the era. This is Shiras here. This is uh, Frank Chapman. He's the famous ornithologist from the Museum of Natural History in New York. They went to the Bahamas on an expedition. Shiras was the photographer. Um, things were improving. Uh, Shiras was getting better equipment all the time. This is a handheld graphic, a graphlex camera. Uh, this is a shot that he took in Newfoundland. There's a hammer in the back and there's his George's camera up here. Of course, he's missing. And these are his glass plates back here. Uh, he always shot on glass plates. They were five by seven inches and uh, they, um, they, they created really fine grained, beautiful images. Um, his, again, uh, he, this is a shot in Louisiana. He's now traveling to many different places. He's no longer working as a lawyer. He considers himself a faunal naturalist and a camera hunter. He never considered himself a wildlife photographer. He always considered himself a camera hunter. Um, and he went to Yellowstone Park three times in um, um, late in the 1908, 1909, 1910. This is a picture that a camera trap took of an elk. But what he was really looking for were moose. And moose had not been seen in the lower 48 for years. Uh, people thought they were extinct or just there were very few left. Now this is Yellowstone Lake. And if you've been to Yellowstone Park, this is Grant Village over here. Uh, the West Thumb uh, geysers are over here. They got some indication that there were some moose up the Yellowstone River. Now this is before the National Park Service. The only people watching the park was, was some military and they were just trying to keep the poachers out. So Shiras and Hammer made three trips up here. And what they eventually found was hundreds of moose living in this sort of splendid isolation. And um, Shiras noticed that the moose were different in color and even in size. And what they discovered was that um, this was actually a separate subspecies of moose. There are four subspecies in North America and it's named after George Shiras. So if you go out to Yellowstone, if you're anywhere in Utah or or Montana, if you see a moose, you're looking at a Shiras moose. You're looking at also Americanus Shirasi. He also went to um, Alaska to take pictures of doll sheep. He went to Admiralty Island to take pictures of uh, uh, bears. His ex exploits were followed in the um, in the newspapers and the magazines. He's becoming, you know, he's well known by this point. 
uh, by the middle teens that uh, who he is. And he goes to Panama in 1913 to take it to uh, when they're filling up the Panama Canal. And um, he's uh, helping capture animals and take pictures of animals. I'm almost done. All during this time, he is advocating for his bird bill. And the bird bill is sort of morphed into a bigger bill being introduced by a couple other people who are still in Congress to not only protect game birds, but to protect all birds. And this is a, a uh, pamphlet that he wrote that was being used for lobbying. Um, it eventually passed first in 1912 as the Weeks-McLean Act. And it set, a, it set federal hunting seasons and bag limits on birds. It outlawed all spring hunting. That way the birds, when they're going north to breed, are not being shot. Uh, it ended the feather trade, although women were starting to move away from that fashion anyway. It eliminated market, market hunting, and Shiras was named to a federal advisory board to, um, to help make this thing happen. Later, it was made into the Bird Treaty of 1919. So the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is what, how you may know it. There was a Supreme Court challenge, Shiras, the lawyer, who had really worked out the legal foundation for why this should be done, actually helped write some of the Supreme Court briefs and that, that extended protection to North America. In 1919, he is honored along with other eminent naturalists, uh, this one being his friend Theodore Roosevelt. Um, this is the last time the two men saw each other. Roosevelt had came back from uh, Brazil he had been injured down there. He had this harrowing experience um, uh, on this expedition. He was not in good shape physically. He pulled Shiras aside and he said, the bullet is on the way for both of us. And what he meant was that, that they're both getting old and they're gonna die. And, and he told Shiras, he said, you need to write your big book. You need to put all your photographs and all your stories into one book. And uh, He'd been telling Shiras this for years. Um, all of Shiras's work had appeared in magazines. And Roosevelt had a funny, he didn't like that. He, he wrote for magazines, but he thought that they were kind of ephemeral, that they would just, you know, that they would, they would go away. And that the only way to really live forever is to write a book. And he had written several books himself. So he kept saying to Shiras, you got to put this in a book. Well, after Roosevelt died just uh, um, a few months later, Shivers finally did put him into uh, these two books that were published by National Geographic. These came out around 1930, about 10 years later. They're dedicated to George, to uh, Theodore Roosevelt, his friend. Um, Shivers uh, lived in Washington, had a winter home in Florida and had a summer home in Marquette. So he spent a lot of time uh, living on Ridge Street in his father-in-law's home. Um, when his wife died in um, 1938, he packed everything up and moved to Marquette and he spent his final years in Marquette. And he's buried in Park Cemetery um, right here in town. Part of the reason he came back is his love of Whitefish Lake. The camp uh, uh, became their camp, and that's where he did all his work. He carved his name, uh, his initials, into a rock right behind the camp, and this is the first year that he came there as a boy. Um, and this is the camp today. Uh, some of the buildings are original, but not many. Um, it's been rebuilt. It's still in the same family. It's up for sale right now. Uh, I'm working with a conservation organization. We're hoping to get enough money to actually buy it and, and, and preserve the camp because this is where wildlife photography was born uh, without a doubt. And so it, it has significance um, as a, uh, a conservation milestone and, and memorial. And that's what we're hoping to do with it. And uh, this is me in the canoe going up to the lake from the camp. So I'll take any questions. Uh, James, I've got kind of a technical question. 
uh, you had obviously like hundreds or maybe thousands of photographs to choose from. Did you get active assistance from the National Geographic Society or did you rely on family archives or how did you go about it? Well, I found some of the family photographs in um, the History Museum down here. And, um, and then the heirs of John Hammer also had some photographs that I was able to get. The actual wildlife photographs, some of those are in the public domain. And so you can go on the internet and you can get them. Of course, um, depending on how those were reproduced, the quality can can uh, can be poor or whatever, but um, no, we spent about a thousand dollars, two thousand. We spent about two thousand um, dollars working with National Geographic and got direct scans from the glass negatives. Oh, nice. Shiras dead. All the photographs that Shiras took, whether in the magazine or in his books, and there were several hundred he gave all of his material to National Geographic. And so it's all there in the archives. And one of the first places I started doing research after I went to Pittsburgh was I went to DC and I spent uh, several days in the archives um, looking at inner office memos, letters and those kinds of things. Thank you. Sure. I'll stop the share so I can see everybody's face. Okay. James, I just want to thank you for such research you did. Oh my goodness. I just, I was fascinated and I just ate it up. I couldn't stop reading. I just kept going and going. It was just wonderful. And I so appreciate what you've done. Oh, good. Thank you. I, I can tell you that I, I never want to write another biography again because <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot of work. Oh it, my! You have to go back and find out who all these people were. You yeah. Know, so when you find a letter by somebody, you don't know who that is, and then you have to find out who it is, and, and then you got to find the other letter that maybe answered that letter, and that could be in a different archive somewhere else. Yeah. Um, but I I know a lot about that period now of, of the conservation era and who the big players were, but. In the beginning, I didn't know who any of these people were. In your uh, studies of uh, George Shuras, did you run across contacts he had with Ernest Hemingway? No, I didn't. And I, I, I've been asked that question before. Um, there, there's been a series on PBS the last three nights about yeah. Hemingway. Yeah. And in that they talk about how he would return to uh, Northern Michigan to the UP. Um, and he of course was more of a fisherman, not a photographer. Uh, well, the, but he knew all, they knew all the same people. They knew Teddy Roosevelt. They were both friends of Teddy's. Yeah, they, um, Sh Hemingway knew who Shiras was. And, and in the book, there's um, a reference to a short story called, I think it's called Homage to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. and, and two of his fictional characters are waiting for a train and they're talking. And one of them asked the other one, so what do you do? And he said, I work for National Geographic. And he said, oh. do, do you know George Shiras two or George Shiras three? And, and, and so they actually have a conversation about George Shiras and about his pictures. Oh, uh, and, and Hemingway weaves that into the short story. Huh. So without a doubt, um, he knew who Shiras was. But no, I never came across anything where the two men actually you know, knew each other. Socially. Yeah. Another question, um, at their camp, did they keep a log? They did. And, and part of, um, in. in the book, there are... Um, there are, um, in one chapter, I quote the log quite a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. What will happen to the log when they're selling the property? Will that become the property of National Geographic or will it no, stay in the building? 
No, the, the you know the 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 camp has been in the white the Peter White family extended family uh, all this time. This this camp and this land has never been uh, touched at all by any you know it hasn't been sold. So um, I was given the the uh, camp log to to uh, to look at by the White family, and and what I'm I'm trying to convince them to give it back sometime. So we can digitize it uh, because it's all written in um, in uh, in longhand and cursive, and and um, it really needs to be kind of parsed out. You know uh, what everything says. I couldn't read everything, and in fact, um, everybody kept a diary back then. Um, you know, and people. Uh, so there are some diaries at the um, history center in Marquette about uh, not George's diaries, but his wife's diaries. And they're almost indecipherable. She wrote really small. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm sure there's a wealth of material in, in these diaries that haven't been touched yet. I think, I think somebody could come back and do another book about this uh, in the future. A fascinating family. Yes, it, it is. I, ha I have a question. Sure. James, I read your book and I love it. I taught accounting at Northern Michigan University as well. And I've all, I want to, as a result of reading your book, I would love to go see Whitefish Lake and the Peter White Camp. Is that possible now? Not now. It's, it's still in private hands. Um, the Nature Conservancy has a large section of the lake out there. Um, the... Alice Reynolds, who um, uh, died, and you know she was related to Peter White. Um, she gave the Nature Conservancy a um, a big piece of property out there, but she didn't give them the camp. And so you you can get onto the Nature Conservancy property. You can you can walk the there's a trail out there called the George III Discovery Trail, and that kind of gets you into the area but it doesn't get you to the camp. And so right now the camp is private. I mean, I'm working with the Lake Superior Watershed. We're hoping to get a grant so we can, you know, again, purchase the property and then at some point open it up. Uh, but right now it's, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's impossible to get out there. Um, I don't blame you for wanting to go there. <laughs> I've been lucky. I've been able to get out there a few times, but I always ask permission and I always make sure I have a really good reason for going, that I need to do some more research or I need to take photographs or something like that. Um, so I haven't kind of over overstayed my welcome at this point. But if you got $998,000, you can buy the whole thing now. And, <laughs> oh, okay. That, that's good to know. And, and I don't think it's a bad deal. It's it, it's a it's an extremely wonderful piece of property. Uh, it gives you access to the lake, and no one else has access to that lake. Um, so we'll see what happens. I have canoed the part of the Whitefish River, the east part of the Whitefish River, and I'd love to canoe the Whitefish Lake at some point, but uh -huh. probably yeah. not for a while. The Lake Superior Watershed has property at the mouth of the Whitefish River on Lake Superior. And uh, so they're hoping that, that, you know, if we get these grants, they can, they can you know, um, maybe partner with the, with the uh, Major Conservancy and, you know, create something out there. I've been bugging Northern Michigan University, too, saying you ought to get involved in this because you could have a biological station out there. Uh, on that lake as well, and you could use it, you know, for teaching. Uh, but no one's listened to me yet. But I, I'm, I'm still bugging them. And and the, the White family, the the Reynolds and the White family who own it, would like to see something like that happen. Um, but at this point, everybody's getting elderly, and 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 the camp's not really being used. Um, and so at this point, you know it's time to, to separate with it. Um, but hopefully we can, we can do something that can benefit the public. That kind of leads me to something that I was gonna mention. I think, you know, if, if and when 
people could donate to a cause like that, you will let us know, won't you? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, I think uh, right now that the, the cost is close to a million, I think our grant that we're hoping to get is going to be around 700000 And um, so at some point, there'll have to be more money raised in, in some way. Yeah. Well, please contact us. Because I think once people have read a book like this, you know, you'd, you'd want to give some money to yeah. an yeah. effort like that. And, and, and the book has been good. We have been sending the book out to, to different people who might have a lot of money or, um, or, or, or also somehow involved in, in, in this grant. So I've sent this book to the East Coast, to Washington, to a bunch of people. Uh, the Forest Service has this, this, this money and they, they, they give out about 8 million a year in this program. And so we're hoping that, um, you know, that it, well, we're just hoping. So we should know pretty soon within the next few weeks. Mm. Where did you say the Nature Conservancy has property out there? They do. The Nature Conservancy has property, but um, ironically, they don't have access to the lake. They have a bunch of land that's kind of up in the up, uplands around that lake, uh, but there's no trail that, that goes down to the water except a little piece. And um, I think the keystone piece is the camp which gives access to the lake. And so in many ways, to me, the Nature Conservancy property um, is sort of cut off. And, and mm. boy, if you could put those two pieces together under the same management, you would basically have what Peter White had, had um, put together many years ago as his hunting preserve, without a doubt. Um, so we'll see what happens. I have a question. I thought your presentation was just excellent. Thank you. And I would like to see it again. I'm wondering if you have this or anything similar to it available as a YouTube. Yeah, if you go to YouTube, uh, I've given a very similar talk and you shouldn't have any problem finding it. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, so I, gave, I gave one out at the Iron uh, Industry Museum out here. Mm -hmm. and, and a couple other ones. And so you can sort of revisit the same thing. I shortened this one up a little bit, um, but yeah, so there's stuff out there. Plus I was on Discovering um, last fall and that's online too. And that's a nice show. He did a really good job with that. And, and we're at the camp walking around. Cool. I have a quick question, James, about, I'm not familiar with the area. We live down on the Menominee in Norway, Michigan. And the river, the whole river is public here, you know, other than the dams and that. Um, but so if it's, if the lake is just a widening of the river, why is that private property? Well, you can't get to it. Like if you put your canoe in, in the other part of the river, and, and tried to canoe up to the lake, um, you, just physically you can't, it would be quite a trip. Uh, beaver dam, beaver dam, beaver dam, um, <laughs> um, shallow water, um, uh, it, it would be an arduous thing to do. <laughs> yeah, so that's the, that's, the, that's the problem. There, there is a place where people have been sneaking in there for years and I know that, um, the, the Nature Conservancy tried to put some big boulders out there to stop people from doing it. Um, but no matter how you get into it, it's not an easy thing to do. From the camp, it's not bad. But even from the camp, you have to get out of your canoe a couple of times and pull it over at Beaver Dam to get up. Wow. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty untouched. The actual shore of it is... Uh, um, there's, you know, it's just woods. It, it, it's undeveloped. So it, it, it's just a really special place. Oh, sure. And, and, hard, and hardly anybody ever goes there. Like, like I said, except the family, but the family um, is now at a point where it's not really using the camp very much, so. So it's not difficult to find the Nature Conservatory property if you go up there? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I don't quite get it. I, I talked to the Nature Conservancy in Lansing. I did a, did a show like this, and and uh, and, I, and 
I said, why don't you have a sign on the road? Oh, yeah. and, and, and they don't. Um, so if you go, um, you go, you, you go to Deerton and, um, and you'll find if you go Google map or whatever, you have to go down the Peter White road and then it's, it branches into like two dirt roads, stay to your left. And eventually you'll come to a little pull off and, but there's no sign there. And, and then there's a little trail that goes in towards the river and you can walk in there and then it kind of becomes evident, you know, there's a trail and there's even signs in the woods, uh, pretty big signs that talk about George Shiras. But the actual um, sign on the road is not there. <laughs> so you could drive by it. It's a rough road. It's, it's, it's not an easy road to get into. Thank you. Sure. Might I has a add to that? Yeah. Could I add to that? Um, if they go to the Anoda Township website, um, you can access a map and driving directions to that conservancy. Oh. So, and it shows the little trails and um, the observation deck and whatnot. So, thank you. Yeah, you can definitely do it. It's just, it's just not, it's not self-evident. Uh, it, it, it takes a little bit to know where to go. Thanks. I have a comment. I don't know if other people felt the same way I did, but I really felt for his, his number one guide there. Was his name Jake? A Jack Lapita. Jack. Yes. Yeah. I kind of felt it was like, you know, mutual of Omaha. And, and that was his trusty Jim Fowler. Like, I mean, he, he seemed to be, you know, getting, doing all kinds of work. I, I, I kind of like to hear his biography too. I, I felt when it was over. Jack Lapita is a, is an interesting one. I mean, he, um, um, they said he was, you know, uh, an Ojibwe and came from, um, um, Sault Ste. Marie, but then later in his life, and that's in the book, he basically said, I'm not really a Ojibwe, and, and I didn't come from um, Sault Ste. Marie. I, I, you know, I was kidnapped, or my mother was kidnapped, and, and, and I came from the Red River. And then he wanted to go back to Manitoba and spend the rest of his life there. So these rich men from Marquette, um, um, sent him back there and then supported him for many years and uh, until his death and he lived to be a, a, a hundred <laughs> and so they were supporting him for many years <laughs> probably more than they thought at the time uh, but yeah he's a great character the other great character in the book is a guy called Jake Brown and and, and Jake Brown was a um, was a guide at the camp and he um uh, he came up to the UP. He was a market hunter. He was hunting deer uh, when he was just 14, and he followed the the, the camps, the the, the, uh, the lumber camps north, and then hung around Marquette. Uh, but he drank a lot. He'd come to Marquette and he would drink all his his um, money up, and so he would go back to the woods to get sober. And then he finally decided that he better leave. So he moved to Idaho, to Henry's Lake, Idaho, where Shiras's um, um, uncle had a, had a similar camp. And he lived out there for a while. And then he, he took off to the Canadian wilderness and he had all these great adventures and no one knew what happened to him. They thought that he died. And then at the very end of Shiras's life and Jake Brown's life, Jake Brown saw these pictures in National Geographic and realized this was his old friend and wrote him a letter. And um, um, they, um, they corresponded for a while. Um, but then the next letter Shiras got was that his friend was dead. And it came from the sheriff of the county in, in, um, um, on Vancouver Island, I think it was Vancouver Island, that he probably died on the shore because uh, he was an elderly man and got washed out by the tide. And, and that's, that, that's how it ended. So th there's some really interesting stories with these men. Yeah, yeah. 
So do we have any um, final questions here? Because we're at a little bit after seven. Anybody want to ask or a final question or a final comment? I've just got a comment. Uh, you know, that bird treaty, that was a real stroke of genius, right? Because what he did was bypass the state's rights by making a treaty with Canada. Is that right? Yes. He did. He, um, um, well, when they made the treaty because they were afraid that the, the bird bill wouldn't work. And um, if you make a treaty with a foreign country, the supremacy clause of the um, the Constitution says that you can't mess with it, you know, once it's uh, a treaty. So that's part of the reason why they made that treaty, uh, without a doubt. I mean, the actual movement to save birds and to create some sort of jurisdiction um, where the feds would, would take jurisdiction over uh, birds um, was a lot of ideas. Audubon was involved in a lot of that, but Shiris was uniquely uh, position as a congressman to introduce it as a bill. And then he was a lawyer. And so he came up with the legal argument justification for why we should do this. But it wasn't popular. There were a lot of states, particularly in the South, that were making lots of money by killing wildlife. And, um, and, um, and so there, were, there was some real kickback. Um, on that as well. So, um, you know, I'd like to write more about that. In fact, I, I'm writing a book proposal right now about maybe writing an entire book about the bird battles of, of that period, because I mm -hmm. learned so much about it that um, uh, I call it the Great Crusade to Save Birds. And it was this great coalition of, of, of hunters and birders and other people who got together and said, we need to do something. Um, and, and it worked out. I mean, it's probably, the bird bill is without a doubt the, the most powerful environmental law prior to the Endangered Species Act um, that actually did a lot of good and is still doing a lot of good. Well, thank you very much for this evening. A couple last comments. Kay, um, the part about Hemingway, I actually wrote that down. That's on page 322 in the book if you wanted to reread that section. And then Michael, this is being recorded. So tomorrow I'm gonna to send everybody the recording link so you could watch it again, if you wanna see exactly the same, or you could try those things that um, James mentioned. But yeah, I just wanna thank you, James. I've read a lot of Tyler Tischler's books, which talk a lot about the, I always say it's Shiris in my mind, but Shiris. A lot of people do, but it's Shiris. The family and the white family. So it was kind of like reading, you know, it was kind of like meeting old friends again. So thank you very much. That was, it was, it was fun when it was done. It was a lot of work to get. To get to oh, work. I bet. But and I, I, I was happy because it, it, it turned out to be um, like a scholarly work. And I, I teach, and so this is kind of like my scholarly book. Um, the, it drove me crazy to have to uh, <laughs> uh, do all of those step notes and all that kind of stuff, because uh, I hadn't done that in my first book. Um, but you did a really, really good job. Thank you very much. Thank you. If any of you are interested in rail travel, my first book is all about rail travel, and Amtrak is hot all over again uh, because of the infrastructure bill. I, I got uh, CNN did a did an interview with me just the other day, and I thought, uh oh, trains are back. You know, oh. uh, they, they called me up because somebody found my book, and um, and so who knows? Maybe things will improve with rail travel too. Yeah. What, what's, what's the name of your book? The train waiting, book. waiting on a train: the embattled future of passenger rail. And so I I rode mm -hmm. all of Amtrak uh, over the course of a year. And um, so it's a mix of, um, of travel. And then it's also, I, I'm interviewing people as I go along who are experts in rail travel, including a lot of people who initially um, helped create Amtrak. Um, so I went back and found some different people. So it, it was a fun book. And, and unfortunately, um, things really haven't gotten much better. <laughs> Maybe they will now, uh, maybe we'll figure it out, but I could almost write the same book today, unfortunately. 
it'd be nice to see it come back. It's going to come back. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. But, um, but, but Antrax's 50 years old, so I've been waiting for a while <laughs> for it to come back well. <laughs> well, please keep in touch with us, James, if there's anything to, that we can do to help as far as your project goes. I, I know a lot of us would be interested in donating to a cause like that. So okay, hopefully. I'll let you know if we need money. <laughs> yes, and hopefully we can get you a little. <laughs> okay, sure. I don't know about that one million, but... <laughs> no, I understand. I think hopefully we can get the big chunk we need some other way. Okay. All, All right, right, and yeah. as for, for everyone else, we'll see you next month. And, and uh, Michael, I'll be in touch with you ahead of time to make sure we're all ready to go. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. You've been watching the UP Notable Books Club, brought to you by the Upper Peninsula Publisher and Authors Association. To join or for more information, please visit us at www.upa.org or www.upnotable.com.